Hello, everybody. Welcome back for another video. Hope you're all doing well and that you're all having an incredible day to start things off. Cryptocurrency exchange Coinbase is looking to license its blockchain analytics software to two U.S. government agencies. According to public records, the Drug Enforcement Administration, or the DEA, and the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS, are planning to buy licenses from Coinbase for a cloud-based software called Coinbase Analytics. According to the prospective DEA contract, Coinbase's software will provide identity attribution for crypto addresses both domestically and internationally. How nice of them. The public documents were issued on the 18th of May and the 7th of April, respectively. Industry publication The Block was the first to report the news. Coinbase would not comment directly on the contracts, of course. However, a spokesperson for the San Francisco-based company told Decrypt that the firm offers its Coinbase analytics product to financial institutions and law enforcement agencies to support compliance and investigation purposes. They said this tool only offers them streamlined access to publicly available data, and at no point do they have access to any Coinbase internal or customer data. We all know that is probably a lie. Coinbase also stressed that Coinbase analytics data does not include any personal identifiable information for anyone, regardless of whether or not they use Coinbase. Once again, uh, how would then the IRS or the DEA be able to find the person who they're looking for without personally identifiable information? You can't just simply give them, yeah, we, here's, here's, here's a huge Bitcoin address. Go find them, dog. Go, go get them. That doesn't make any sense. You clearly have to tell them the exact information that they're looking for. And this is why many other cryptocurrency exchanges have had problems in the past. Because government agencies have simply gone to them and said, oh, yeah, we're looking for um, a person. So give us the data of every single person on this platform. And then what ends up happening is, is they have your data, whether you did something or not. And depends on uh, what they deem to be a crime sometime in the future. So um, we've also heard the last couple of days, and I also read something a bit earlier as well. It was talking about the uh, Coinbase while they're big, uh, has not been doing quite well with onboarding new members. And a lot of people who have been on their platform have been shutting down their accounts. I assume it has to do with stuff like this. Um, don't assume that Coinbase is going to be the only cryptocurrency exchange to be, uh, wow, doing something like this. But uh, yeah, just, I mean, it's at, at this point, when it comes to Coinbase, me, myself, personally, I am no longer surprised. Uh, if you look at the actual beginnings of Coinbase, they were meant to be this gigantic. Uh, they wanted to, at, at some point as well, be decentralized. They wanted to be this huge network of people who wanted to get into the Bitcoin space, who wanted decentralization, who wanted proper freedom for their money. That is completely out of the window. If you are selling and giving information and data to the IRS and DEA, you clearly are um, right. It says Coinbase offers US Fed's new crypto surveillance tools. Uh, this, was, this was your news that's everywhere news. Of course, people are gonna be a bit, I don't wanna use the word riled up, but um, yeah, uh, take the news how you will, because we're gonna have more stuff like this. I'm completely expecting a dramatic rise in the next couple of years. And I don't know how, because we should have a huge amount of usage right now, but we simply don't on uh, decentralized exchanges. And I hope for the goodness of humanity that those increase in popularity relatively soon because yeah. Um, anyway, that's the Coinbase uh, DEA IRS news. And let's move on. Also in what this doesn't make any sense news the u.s market seemed to be recovering these days the nasdaq composite managed to reach a new record high i repeat that one more time you are all alive you've been around for the last i want to say four to five to six months you know what's going on uh for some reason the stock market continues to go up and the nasdaq reached a new all-time high think about that the U.S. stock market's rally 
has been caused by the positive numbers that have come in. Sources say that the non-farm payrolls rose by 2.5 million. The unemployment rate fell to 13.3%. This has happened as the jobless expectations were 8.3 million or 19.5%. However, such figures would have made it the worst since the Great Depression. Once again, these are the official figures for people. And I, and I have to keep stressing this because I've had this conversation with a couple of friends before. They were telling me, as if I didn't already know, that the jobless numbers within the U.S. alone were around, I think, 42 million was the last official number that we got. It was 41 or 42 million people. And they were like, wow, that's so many people. And then these numbers came out and people were like, wow, that's amazing. Joblessness has gone down. If you've never had a job in the States before or jobs in many other places, this is how it normally works. You have to have had that job for over 366 days. You have to have worked there for over a year. And after you lose your job, you are then able to apply for jobless benefits. This means if you were working a job for nine months, 10 months, or 11 months, which is very, uh, very common right now because many people are working two to three jobs, especially younger people, because most companies are only hiring part-time because they don't want to give actual benefits to their employees within the States. Yes, that's how it works. This is why many people have three different jobs. Uh, these people have also been fired, especially it, it doesn't matter if it's hospitality, if it's Starbucks, it doesn't really matter what kind of job situation it actually is. So you have an entire slew of millions of other people. These may be people who are also cleaning uh, hotels, hospitals, schools, whatever the case might actually be. These people are also now jobless. And a lot of these people are not able to actually apply for these benefits. So the jobless numbers that we keep getting are only the official numbers for people who are legally allowed to apply for these jobless benefits, which means that there are probably at least in a country of 350 million people, at least another 20 million people who are also without jobs. Not to mention uh, debt hasn't decreased. The U.S. has continued printing U.S. dollars. People still haven't been able to pay off their credit card debt, their mortgage debt, any other kind of debt that they do have. And the only stimuli check that has been sent out is the $1,200. It's been February, March, April, May. We are now in June on the first of the month. That's usually when rent is due. So it's been about a good four to five months for millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people across the U.S. who have had to pay rent, had to pay off mortgages, had to pay off debt, and many other things and have not been able to do so. You understand where this is all going? So whenever we get these numbers, understand that they are used in their own way to try and show that things are getting better when they're really not. Got it? All of that is a new record for the NASDAQ. Sources say that much of the jobs rebound had to do with the temporary claims that came from the hospitality and leisure industry. Despite the new jobs, the job market is still in 20 million below pre-19 levels. These numbers on a normal day seem anemic. Anemic? Okay, but at the time, they offer hope that the U.S. economy will try and recover. It also gives much hope that things will get better. I, 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 I think people need to really sit down and have a, an, an actual talk with themselves. When you look, and I implore you, I don't, I don't care what channel you use, what news you decide to absorb. Watch the actual financial news and, and listen to the actual experts who go on there and what they say. This recovery is completely false. There is no actual recovery. Like, think of everything that's gone on. These are the pre, these are the other levels during actual recessions, crashes, what have you. This is during the 80s. This is the now, and this is the little dip that they were reporting on. I assure you, these numbers have nothing to do with the actual, like, the stock market rallying is, is completely false. Like, there's no reason for the market. And, and even more so, the fact that the stock market has rallied over the last, like, two or three weeks after we kept on getting job numbers that more people were losing their jobs and tons of people were actually defaulting, it's all a farce. I don't know how to really explain that any better. Um, the entire point being, uh, the world's markets right now are on a thin razor edge ledge, if you kind of want to say that. Nothing, I don't have to continue uh, on that point, but nothing has actually gotten better. Things are exactly the same as they were. They're, they're bad and they may have gotten worse. When you have all these people around the world who don't have jobs, aren't going to get their jobs back anytime soon. 
and also can't pay their rent and stuff like that, we are sitting on a bubble and everyone's bouncing on it, thinking that it's really fun, not understanding that at some point it's going to pop. And the people, the problem is the people who are going to be damaged the most are the people who are pumping their money into the markets right now. A lot of the markets are being held up and inflated by the $7 trillion that the U.S. and many other countries have also been printing to buy up equities, to buy up stocks, to buy up derivatives and all these other things to make it seem as though the market is still buoyant. Tons of other people around the world, like I told you, I've been getting a huge amount of friends and family members asking me, like, what should I invest in? How to put money into stocks? And I, and I tell them the... Maybe you should wait a bit, but I think it just, I don't think they care. I don't think people really understand. Like people just only hear, I want to make money. I hear on the news that the markets are going back up. And I'm like, okay, well, you can use this. You can use that. Do your own research. And, and I already know at that point, I'm getting the beep, like, like, like the, the, the dead dial tone when I um, talk to them. Because so many people right now are putting their money into the markets, trying to catch that 2008, 2009 low wave, you know, when, when the market went back up, it kept on going up and everyone made tons of money, but we're in a very different situation right now. It's not something as simple as, uh, anyway. Um, so the people who will lose are the normal people pu putting their money into the market, trying to get a good deal. The market will crash and then they'll be the losers. And then the rich people knowing exactly when the actual bottom is, will throw their money back into the market because they've all cashed out of the market at this point. Remember a couple of months ago when the people from BACT and the other uh, senators and congressmen and stuff like that had pulled their money out of the market in February and March? All the rich people have left the market already. So that's that news um, for today. And without further ado, let's move on. In... Okay, news. A, another report from Bloomberg that provides a crypto market outlook for June says that it expects Tether to surpass Ethereum in market cap. The report notes the growth of Tether's market cap as one of the main drivers for the appreciation of Bitcoin. It says interest in digital links to the dollar represents the need to transact and store value in the world's reserve currency without an intermediary. Recently, the stablecoin has overtaken XRP as a number three cryptocurrency by market cap. Bloomberg asserts that it will not stop there, but will march straight past Ether into the second spot. It says absent an unlikely reversal in predominant crypto trends. It should be a matter of time until Tether passes Ethereum to become the number two coin behind Bitcoin. Bitfinity from widespread adoption with a viable case as a proxy for the world's reserve currency. There seems little to stop the increasing adoption of the dollar-linked stable coin. At the same time, the report contends that Ether lives in Bitcoin's shadow and has no buoyancy of its own. It says, we see little upside in the Ethereum price absent a rising tide from Bitcoin. The preeminent crypto is breaking away from the pack in terms of adoption and is supported by almost ideal macroeconomic conditions for stores of value amid quantitative easing. I don't even know where to begin with all of this. First of all, the fact that Bloomberg, Forbes, and all these other magazines are so hyper bullish on Bitcoin, just please take note of that. I, I, I mentioned this and said this before in the last uh, episode. Uh, two, um, Ethereum's price was $80 this year, and it's currently at around $240, $250. Ethereum's price has been rising uh, on the expectations that we are going to get Ethereum 2.0 this year. I'm not understanding the, I mean, well, first of all, I was going to say I'm not understanding the, the, the bearish uh, sentiment towards Ethereum at the moment, especially from the likes of Bloomberg. But once again, uh, the people from Coinbase also believe that, they, that they're relatively bearish on Bitcoin because they love Ethereum. So I'm going to assume that the people from Bloomberg are bearish on Ethereum because they probably hold lots of Bitcoin. It's just how the, um, the weigher... The, the scales go, the weigher. What's the, what's the weigher? Um, I also find it unlikely that Tether would pass Ethereum. I think Tether's market cap is like, was it $8.9 billion or something like that? And I think Ethereum is like $29 billion. Ethereum would have to collapse in price and Tether would have to relatively, you know, print about $2 billion more Tether, which I guess at this point isn't relatively unlikely for Tether. Uh, but also, Ethereum's been doing fairly well in price simply because, once again, it looks like 
We're going to be getting Ethereum 2.0 relatively soon. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Just, that's a lot of, I, hmm. We always get tons of speculation and people wondering and observing where they think things are going to go. And a lot of them don't actually end up being true. I've been reading a lot of articles that people have been talking about that this is Bitcoin's last stand and Bitcoin has to do this and Bitcoin has to so-and-so. And then you look around, there's a website. I, I assume it's still around. It's called like, um, how many times Bitcoin died or uh, Bitcoin, not memorials. I can't remember the, the word of it. There's a website that has like a link to every single time that someone has claimed that Bitcoin was dead. And the last I checked, it was over like 150 times. And that was like three or four years ago. Um, I think the same exact thing is going to happen to Ether. I don't think Ether is really going anywhere, especially I assume the people from Bloomberg understand that we have had multiple governments now who said that they're going to be using and or building on top of Ethereum. So don't really get where that's going. Um, it would be a very odd day. A very awkward day for the entire cryptocurrency space. If, <clears throat> if Tether became the number two coin. Kind of odd indeed. Anyway, that's the Bloomberg Ether Tether news. And let's move on. Very, very weird, very weird news. Next up, three leading Japanese banks will set up a study group to explore the benefits of developing a common settlement infrastructure for digital payments in the country. According to a New York Times report, three major Japanese banks are planning to set up a study group to explore the benefits of developing a common settlement infrastructure for digital payments. Mitsubishi, UFJ, Financial Group, Inc., Mitsuho, Financial Group, Inc., and Sumitomo Mutsi, nope, Mitsui, Financial Group, are the three leading banks of Japan that will form a study group to explore the digital payment infrastructure. East Japan Railway and several other non-financial firms are also planning to participate. Your local crypto exchange, Decurrent, Decurrent, Decurrent will serve as the group's organizer. The officials, what, what's Decurrent? The officials for the exchange noted that representatives from the Bank of Japan, the Ministry of Finance, and the Financial Services Agency will attend the meetings as observers. The group will meet twice a month from June through September of this year. According to the report, the Japanese are among the most cash-using population in the world, and the government is trying to reduce this trend and increase and instead promote cashlessness uh, during the time of 19, which is something we spoke about in February. This is a very good time for a, for a power grab. It is very easy to say, oh, be afraid, be scared, stop using what you were using before. Uh, let's go cashless and digital to be able to help you. Um, this doesn't, once again, this is all, th there's always a mask over what's actually happening. It's that governments want to make sure that they know where all cash payments are. A couple of years ago, I'm going to say this quick, a couple of years ago, the thing with India where they got rid of their largest bill, I think it was the 500. I remember the exact number. I know it was their largest, uh, paper bill. This happened across many other countries as well, but I think India was the most significant because they gave people in their countries two days notice. And it was like thousands of people standing outside of banks, uh, waiting to hand in their paper money for lower denominated bills. Uh, and they the, the, the entire reason many countries said that this was for is that they could not keep track of people's taxes anymore and they felt that people were paying too little taxes or they simply wanted to make sure that they knew where all the money was going as the transactions were happening. And if people were trying to anti-KYC money, uh, they could simply do so by transferring into these big bills, putting them into a suitcase and traveling. Not, not even joking. That was part of the actual uh, reason why. So it's not surprising and it should not be surprising at all that we are seeing now multiple times this year, many banks talking about either creating their own CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, or um, increasing efforts to digitize their economy as a whole. I think the the major silver golden lining is that a lot of them have um, legalized Bitcoin and trading and holding and selling and buying and all those other wonderful things and at the same exact time are not, I don't want to say not paying attention to Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is allowed to kind of, you know, grow on its own in the, in the side. So 
We'll see when this battle comes to a head because it's going to. Once the digitization of everything has happened, or at least fiat currencies over the next five years, I think we're going to see a huge battle play out, but you already know how I feel about that. Anyway, uh, not surprising at all. I think every other day we have news like this, that there's some type of a, a country who's releasing information about doing this. Anyway, that's that news. And let's move on. Also, in unsurprising news, because banks love cryptocurrencies, Switzerland's financial regulator, Finma, has approved two Zurich-based banks to offer a range of cryptocurrency services, including trading and custody. Merki Baumann Bank subsequently announced the launch of its trading platform for major cryptocurrencies, while Incor Bank is offering a range of crypto services. The Swiss Financial Market Supervisory Authority, or FINMA, recently approved two banks, Mayor Kai Baumann and Incor Bank, to offer a number of cryptocurrency services to two financial institutions independently announced on Friday. Baumann, a Zurich-based private bank with a dedicated crypto desk, stated Friday that it has obtained a license from FINMA to offer the trading and custody of cryptocurrencies as well as other digital assets, tokens, with a new license. The bank will be offering its clients the trading and custody of cryptocurrency starting this month, noting that its trading platform will also all offer support for ERC-20 tokens, which is fairly common as well. Usually we hear, we, we, we normally hear about the ERC-20s before we hear about the actually the other, the other assets. They said, Bauman will initially offer trading in Bitcoin, Bcash, Ether, Litecoin and XRP. There's a little photo of the bank right there. Besides providing bank business bank accounts for crypto and blockchain companies, the bank has also been supervising ICOs, interesting, and STOs for its clients. As of December 31st, 2019, the bank had approximately 8.5 billion Swiss francs, francs, francs in asset under management, 80% of which originated in Switzerland and 10% in Germany. Uh... No surprise. Zero percent. Uh, we, we still have not. Yeah, that's kind of weird. We haven't heard about, about the, the, the German banks who had applied for uh, crypto custody and all those other types of things. Quite fascinating in its own way. I myself find it is, is the word ironic. No, I, I'm pretty sure it's not ironic. Funny? They, they all hated us before at the exact same time they were all accumulating tons of cryptocurrency assets. Keeping in mind, once again, uh, as a bank, you do not bet on something, offer something, trade something, or custody something without holding it yourself. You, in some way, have to also believe in said asset. Gold, golds. Banks usually hold gold or sell gold or whatever the actual case might be with gold because they are betting on the price of gold as a stabilizer and or going up during economic turmoil. So one can only assume if these mega gigantic Swiss banks are also going to be allowing the, the trading, buying, and selling of Bitcoin, Bcash, Ether, Litecoin, and XRP, and all for cryptocurrency trading desks and custodying, and ERC-20 tokens. They probably are holding a lot of them themselves. They're probably, once again, they probably have more than one Bitcoin. They probably have um, at least several million dollars worth. Anyway, uh, this also cuts down on the actual circulating supply for everyone else, because once again... If there is, keep all of this in mind always, it's very important. If there are two mega Swiss banks who are accumulating Bitcoin, it's safe to assume that probably the someone or some people who are employed there are also accumulating. The heads of the bank are accumulating for their own, like they don't want to have it on the bank's assets. They want it in their own, you know, portfolio. And then other smaller banks will kind of go, well, they're doing it. Let's also try and put half a million in our um, um, spreadsheets as well. Anyway. Um, that's the Swiss bank news. A lot of like weird, like regulatory money bank, uh, law enforcement news today. Anyway, that's that news. Let's move on. And to finish things off, despite local currency, cryptocurrency uncertainty, excuse me, Russia is strengthening its leadership on major peer to peer exchange, local bitcoins. And the share of Bitcoin trading volumes. Russia has traded the most Bitcoin on local Bitcoins for two consecutive months. They were April and May, according to an analysis by crypto media startup Crypto Differ. 
According to the data, Russia was responsible for 19% of total Bitcoin trading volume on local Bitcoin this May, leaving Venezuela and the U.S. behind. Local Bitcoin's trading volume in the U.S. and Venezuela accounted for 11 and 10%, respectively. Total Bitcoin trading volumes on local Bitcoins in May amounted to 17,867 Bitcoin. The firm found the information provided by Crypto Differ apparently coincides with data from major Bitcoin statistics website Coindance. According to Coindance's website, Russia's weekly Bitcoin trading volumes on local Bitcoin accounted for about 800 Bitcoin in May. Meanwhile, Venezuela and the U.S. were trading around 400 Bitcoin per week during the same period. Uh, this is unsurprising as it appears at least the news that we've been getting over the last 18 months which has all been topsy-turvy flippy wurvy because none of it has actually made sense it appears that russia is on the cusp of banning bitcoin in some sort of way that is either the trading of it the owning of it the custodying of it the buying of it the holding of it or the mining of it all of which seem fairly likely right now. We've also had indications before that Russia is one of the countries who was looking into creating their own central bank digital currency. But at the same exact time, we also had news before that Russia was apparently also potentially buying up Bitcoin themselves. No surprise there. Uh, so it's, pr you know, it's only logical that people who are desperate to get into or stay into the market are probably trying to accumulate as much Bitcoin as they can in an effort to do whatever they might need to do um, should things get bad. I have a feeling they won't ban it. I have a feeling trading will be banned. I have a feeling over-the-counter markets, um, OTC markets, will definitely be a major point throughout the country. The news that we had before in 2018 was that over-the-counter markets, should they be provided or allowed, would only allow normal people to, I think, do, what was it? I think $1,500 per year or something nonsensical like that, where if you were a, if, if you were rich enough, that's, I mean, the, the, you know, the easiest way to say it, if you were rich enough, there would be no restrictions on you, which is also insane. Can you, it, it only allows the, the, the richest of the rich to continue to become hyper rich. Like imagine, imagine you yourself, you're only allowed to buy $1,500 worth of Bitcoin right now. You get roughly around 15 million Satoshis, roughly around. Bitcoin's price goes to $100,000. You have a good chunk of change, but not as much as if you could have purchased an entire Bitcoin or two Bitcoin or three Bitcoin. Anyway, um, no surprise. Um, I do like, however, that we continuously get news, continually, continuously get news, uh, from outlets that um, the buying and selling or buying in this instance of Bitcoin is fairly popular in many countries where they are either undergoing <laughs> terrible amounts of inflation or hyperinflation or where it appears that things are looking not good, choosing my words lightly. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's that news. And let's move on. As always, a very special thank you to my Patreon supporters. Professor Wally from Gunbot University. Oscar Maldonado, Utopia569, Yasha Harari, Moonman High, XRP, The Pothead, Joshua Vineyard, Martin Storio, Chongo Lolo, Tsongo Lolo, Nostromo, John Sarson, The Animal Reader, A Bibliophobia, Todd Mullis, Adam Grasick, Moher Maroney, Mass Adventures in Thailand, Jared Schneider, Wise Night Owl, 242 to the World, Crypto Joe, Bankroll Network, Adobo, Crypto Artist, Cold E3D, Nicholas Renault, the One Piece, One Love, Damien Set, Suna, Nick Kanaya, Richie Rich, the Third, Vlad the Impaler, Paxis, Nick Manji, Alabori, Anthony Charles, Jim Gardner, Jeremy Fox, Minting Coins, Miller, Hitchcock, Everyday, and Kyle Skips, Leg Day, Yes to Crypto, Bodie McBoatface, <laughs> Bodie McBoatface, <laughs> it just hit me right now, I'm a little late, Anytime Fitness, Monks Corner Staff, Arf Medic 17, Bake Me a Cake, Tigera Macho Nisa, On Crypto with Lino, Crayola Michelle, URL, and hold on, I have to sneeze. Thank you all, every single one of you, very, very much for your support. Thank you to everyone who is a Patreon member. Thank you to everyone who is a member of this channel. Thank you to everyone who has subscribed to my newest channel. And thank you to everyone who is a clicker of affiliate links at the moment. It's like down up. If that makes any sense, Bitcoin is currently down by 1.49%. Is at 9,677 US dollars. It's down 
But there's been a spike in the last hour. No actual reasoning as to why. I assume it's just the, the time for the for the up and the downs. Um, EOS is up by three percent. Sure, why not? Um, Zillica's up. Sure. Uh, yeah, I guess that we're having a. A, a, a slightly red uh, weekend start, uh, not too surprising. I mean, I, I, I think life is interesting right now in, in all aspects of, of the meaning. Um, I do hope that you all enjoyed. I wonder how this is going to play out for Coinbase because, um, yeah, I mean, er every day it's just... Between Coinbase and BitMEX, it's just looking gross every single time. Uh, I do hope you all enjoyed. Hope you all are having a great day, a great morning, a great afternoon, a great evening. Wherever you are, wherever you might be, I do hope it's absolutely fantastic. Thank you all once again for watching and or listening. Off to the new channel, and I will most certainly be talking to you all soon. See you